Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks to Professor Banshi Sabu for making this mega event possible. I was talking to Dr. Joshi that uh, I'm a sandwich between the two extreme brilliant scholar orator. Dr. Joshi spoke uh, just 15 days back, about a month back, on a newer molecule, and nobody can match his presentation. I'm too old to match his presentation, his skill, his oratory, and his. Dr. Alka Desh Pandey is another Padma Shri Awadi. Uh, my contemporary, maybe I stand a little older than her. But Dr. Joshi becomes, every time I meet him, every month he becomes younger by one year. We become older gradually as the days passes. We we'll talk on the newer hope of another molecule about the renal outcome in type 2 adaptism. You understand when we were a registrar resident in the dialysis unit, about one-third patient would be having a diabetes. Because most of the patient at that time dumped as a chronic kidney disease and this is renal failure. Chronic glomerulonephritis, CGN used to be the diagnosis. But now we understand that more than 48.8% prevalence of CKD in type 2 diabetes patient across the population. It's six times higher risk of developing comorbid mortality because of the cardiovascular mortality. And that's the important we can save the patient by doing dialysis, can prolong his life, could be patient transplanted even, but most of these patients succumb during dialysis or even post-transplant because of the coronary event, very bad coronary artery, three artery block, massive infarction. So six times higher risk of death. And this is what is happening, the risk of CE events in patients with diabetes increases as albuminuria progresses. I'll tell you in a moment why albuminuria is so very important as a screening point. And uh, EGFR would slowly deteriorate. In diabetic nephropathy, otherwise also, even you don't treat or you treat, there would be slowly decrease in EGFR. 10% of EGFR would fall slowly over every decade. So 60 year, if it is normal, 70, 80, 90, by the time you reach 90 year, you will have a reserve of hardly 60 to 40 percent in a healthy population. This is what would happen. The hyperglycemia at bad milieu would initiate microangiopathy, endothelial cell dysfunction, neogenesis, increased surface area, then hyperfiltration. And after sixth pathogenic mechanism, you get a stage one of CKD, that's the hyperfiltration where the EGFR is high, followed by podocyte damage, membrane damage, and proteinuria. So the drivers which are important to drag you on the bad path are the bad metabolic milieu that would initiate the process, then the hemodynamic changes in afferent and efferent arteriole, and pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's a debate when these inflammatory cytokine starts. However, they could start right from this day one, attacking the tubular interstitial damage, sclerosis, mesangial expansion, and then hypertrophy. We call it glomeropathy rather than glomerulonephritis. This is the bad milieu. And there are three important jack stat. Now we have a molecule which is going to answer this. We have neprilysin NR of 2 and rho kinase, and the adhesion molecule. All these molecules start simultaneously, the inflammatory cytokine, pro-inflammatory, the bad milieu, and the changes in the basement membrane, the transcription factor, and then the macrophage infiltration. The podocytes are one which initiates the story. And therefore, the albuminuria becomes one of the important points in the screening process. And this is because of the size of the albumin is about 120 Armstrong unit. The pore within the epithelial is about the 90, and the lumen, the distance between travel and the tubule is about 100. So albumin cannot pass through in healthy basement membrane. It's only the damage of the basement membrane. So the older teaching was, it is the silo protein. You have a albumin, negative charge, they repel each other. Once you have a inflammatory changes in the basement membrane, the charges changes, albumin gets adhered to, and then it seeps through. So, podocyte damage is the first event in hyperglycemia. People often ask, what is the first event? This is the first event in induced apoptosis. In high glucose increases reactive oxygen species and sequential upregulation of cytochrome. 
and this podocyte damage would initiate the activated cell which would lead to destruction. This hyperactivated RAS contribute to the elevated intraglomerular capillary pressure. So that is the hyperfiltration. That is the stage one, where the EGFR could be 140, 120, 130, serum creatin still would be down, and this patient would ignore, or physician would ignore. This is the two FOXO4. I want you to concentrate on this side. This is the FOXO4 on this side, which is responsible for the apoptosis, and also TGF beta, and there are the molecules being looked into. Th this is important, the epithelial mesenchyme transition. When podocyte dies, there is apoptosis of the podocyte. The good soldiers have died on the front. When they have died, they have left some message to the younger generation. And they transform. This is called mesenchymal transformation. The adhering mesenchymal cell goes to the mesangium, makes a good fibroblast, initiates fibroblast growth factor so that now kidney can sustain the enormous change into the environment. That's called the mesenchymal transition. Why this is important? Because this newer molecule which I'm going to talk today is going to answer this particular onslaught. So we have drug long back about three decades now as inhibitor. Four de Bogenson used for this captopril and then there was the more improvement. Then we have ARBs, we have SGLT2. Calcium channel blocker, dihydroperidine derivatives have been existing for almost four or five decades. And they do decrease the proteinuria. So hemodynamic changes, then we have metabolic, better drugs, SGLT2, GLPRS, metformin, recently being talked, and then we had an inflammatory and fibrosis. This has not been answered. The inflammatory cytokine, the fibroblast growth factor, the laying of the fibrous tissue, and preventing the sclerosis, that not have been answered. So this is the proteinuria now, the hallmark. And the podocyte, the mesangial cell, the glomerular hyperfiltration, and the vascular ischemia all contribute in reduction of GFR. This is the progression, podocyte damage first, proteinuria then, mesenchymal transition third, hypertrophy four, renal fibrosis fifth, sclerosis, hypertension, and then stage renal disease. Long way to go before a patient comes to a clinician or be himself a screen and find that his creatinine is up or even albumin is there in the urine. Despite of four or five decades availability of RAS inhibitor drugs, AZ inhibitor, ARBs, is still only 16% risk reduction. Or when we add SGLT2 inhibitor, this becomes a little better, becomes 30% to 50%. So 50% patients have still been unanswered how to protect their kidney, how to protect sclerosis. This is what the, we are talking today, MR overactivation, which is a major driver in whole of the process. It's a receptor which regulates gene expression through cofactor. In renal disease, multiple factors overactivate, aldosterone, RAC, cortisol, and also the pro-inflammatory cytokine. This is what is the old, this is old slide, aldosterone. And we all have a drug for the last three decades. It is responsible for sclerosis, interstitial fibrosis, proteinuria, renal failure, and of course, cardiac hypertrophy and endothelial dysfunction. On my right side, uh, you have the steroidal mRNAs, like spironolactone, we have used it. We have apilirinone, which is being now used for the last 10 years. On my left side, uh, other side, you have a dihydroperidine, ferronerone, which we are going to talk today, and also the combination of the two and looking at the, their fate, how do they act, how they prevent the inflammatory fibrosis and take care of the... This is what the insult is going... Because kidney perceive that the moment podocyte has been damaged, there is increased fibrosis, there is increased glomerular bed. Kidney thinks by nature right from the day one, 4.5 billion years before the single cell was born. All biological cells, they think sodium is less to us. So they start reclaiming the sodium. You filter the sodium, 
you absorb 85% from the proximal tubule, you leave only 15%, even that is also being absorbed by the aldosterone from the distal tubule. So what does it do? It produces T cell damage, activation, blocks TS17, works on the macrophage, works on the fibroblast, works on the endothelial cell, a smooth muscle cell, podocyte and mesenchymal cell. So whole story in the kidney parenchyma, right from the vascular to the epithelial cell, is responsible for the damage by MRA antagonist. This is what the kidney damage would be. These uh, receptors would be responsible for nephrology sclerosis, nephropathy, cyclosporine induced toxicity, and one of the very important tissue for the transplant physician, proteinuria and the stage renal disease. This is the story of the molecule being developed. We knew this is the DOCA, and there was a beautiful articular D-rays, what is called DOCA escape phenomena, or aldosterone escape phenomena. You take animal, infuse normal saline, give the DOCA, there will be a stage by which the sodium will be absorbed. Subsequently, it would fail to absorb any amount of sodium. The, it was developed to 1943, and then now we have in 2016 and 19 this newer molecule over the epilinon. So look at the beneficial property of MRAs, decreases mortality in hospitalization in CHF and acute heart failure patient post-MI, decreases BNP, anti-pro-VNP, improves on diastolic dysfunction, decreases fibrosis, arrhythmia which is induced by MRA, oxidative stress, and progression. So we have three, is spironolactone, which is steroidal, this is cyclopentone per hydrofenin 3 nucleus, Epilinon, again the same nucleus, but it's at a disadvantage of rising serum creatinine, de deteriorating renal function. But then we have a Byers non steroidal phenylenon, which is, uh, has got a high selectivity and has only one problem of the hyperkalemia, otherwise normal. So what this new drug trial is, this is Fidelio and Figaro trial. This is a two group. One is Fidalio, where the EGFR is on the lower side, mean EGFR 45, 4.3, but the proteinuria is on the higher side. This is the contrast. When kidney, the EGFR decreases, the proteinuria also decreases and normal end stage renal. In diabetes, it is reverse. In spite of decrease in EGFR, proteinuria continues to rise. In Figaro trial, on the other hand, you have a patient of the normal GFR, 7.8, little higher GFR, and proteinuria was less. This is 312, and more than 300 was the 51.2. So 50%, more than 50% patient in Figaro trial had proteinuria, which was on the higher side. On contrast, 87.4% patient in the Fidelio trial had proteinuria on the higher side. So it was 10 milligram versus 20 milligram crossover trial studies. And the Fidelio DKD, which has a low GFR with high protein urea, it was 5,734 patient. In Figaro, it has a 7,433 7%. The philosophy was that if you intervene the patient in Fidelio who had low GFR, high albuminuria, high proteinuria, how much you can prevent their deterioration. On contrary, those who had already been uh, on the higher side of GFR with little proteinuria, and this was the comparative study. This was the maximum tolerated drug therapy patient already took is ARB plus any other drug and had reduction of primary kidney outcome by 18%. And this was looking at the Fidelio trial, and this is the great achievement, 31% from the baseline versus placebo, and this is secondary endpoint, where it is the 34%, 24%. So secondary kidney composite endpoint was 24% risk reduction, and it was 31% on the album reduction. I said in the beginning, Albumin seepage is the key factor in upregulating the fibrosis and the stage renal disease. So it's important to refer the albuminuria rather than the 
serum creatinine. Looking at the CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, hospitalized four-point base, and when you look at this four-point base, this was again 14 percent. When you look at the Figaro now, the other one, it reduced the risk of the primary CV point by 13 percent. So it was 18 percent in the first, 13 percent because this patient, this group of the patient, EGFR was relatively on the higher side. So there's no point. No point in hitting a horse when it's already running, but the, when horse is tired, then you can kill the horse and it would do the better performance. Look at the secondary outcome, and here is the point is that what you should did not significantly reduce the clinical accepted more than 40% decrease in EGFR. This is what I was talking to you. Your GFR would continue to deteriorate. The question is how much you hold the progression of GFR. Now, when you look at the phenernon trial of hyperkalemia, I said in the beginning, because this is the only molecule, there was little high potassium, but clinically this was not significant, and no death due to hyperkalemia and the incidence of treatment discontinuation or hospitalization due to hyperkalemia. In traditional epilenon, traditional when you use spironolactone, there is a problem of the hyperkalemia. More so when you are using ACE inhibitor, more so when you are using ARB, more so when you are using SGLT2 inhibitor. So this is what is the important issue. I'll come in a moment to the both. Initial part, whether you use SGLT2 inhibitor or you use AS or ARBs, there could be some drop in EGFR. This is what happened with phenylalanine also. Initial year that could be dropped, but subsequent year there would be significant improvement in EGFR. And that's a caution, and that's what you should look. This is the uh, efficacy outcome, and phenernon stands better for the kidney failure and the stage kidney disease, such strain decrease in EGFR, as well as just from the cardiovascular non fatal MI. Four point. This is called fidelity. When you merged both trials together and you tried to work up the calculation, this is what the answer is. Together, when you try to mix both, there is decrease in 14% CV death, 12% in non-fatal MI, 9% in non-fatal stroke, and then hospitalization. Overall, this is 22% reduction. Fidelity again, 23% risk reduction, and 57% EGFR composite outcome. That's the wonderful, even as good as any SGL2 inhibitor or MA Empiric trial or this is the when you are using in combination with SGLT2. I said in the beginning, even these patients as ASARBs, SGLT2 inhibitor, the reduction in albuminuria would be 32% from the baseline without SGLT1 and with SGLT1, this is 37%. So it scores again. 5% is scoring above the SGLT2 guideline. This is the summary slide now. Overall, there is 2.6 year median follow-up. So, so there is 17.8% risk reduction when it comes to the renal point, composite point. When it comes to the cardiac, there's 13%. So in patients with CKD and type 2 diabetes, treatment with phenylalanine resulted in the low risk of CKD progression and cardiovascular death. This is summary. Phenylalanine significantly reduced 18% and 14% risk of coronary event and also reduced 13% in Figaro trial as well as 36% and there's a significant uh, advantage. So therefore, it is now included in the ADA guideline 2022 in patients with CKD who are at increased risk of cardiovascular event or CKD progression. SGLT2 inhibitor, a non steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor, antagonist phenylalanine is recommended. And for patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD treated with maximum tolerated dose of AZ inhibitor, phenylalanine should be considered to improve cardiovascular outcome. And both is level A. Thank you very much.